Hi, and welcome to Preview. My name is Guy Giampapo. Preview. 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 Julie, the story of composer Julie Stein. He's our guest tonight on Hollywood Backlot. My name is Guy Giampapo, and I can't say any more about Julie Stein, but welcome, Julie. Glad to be here with you. It's terrific nice having you with us. Thank you. <laughs> Julie, that's a fantastic book. I spent Saturday evening and part of Sunday reading it. And I not only read it, but I reread portions of it. There's so much beautiful material in there, especially the Hollywood story. Now, I, I want to talk about that tonight, if we can. Lovely. You, you must have a million stories about it. Please tell me about it. Well, uh, the Hollywood story. Now, why don't you choose a personality? Because there's so many, uh, Marilyn Monroe or Frank Sinatra or... OK, or let's do it in sequence. Let's start with Republic Pictures. Republic Pictures. Well, as you well know, I was brought out to 20th Century Fox to coach Shirley Temple mm -hmm. and Alice Faye. Uh, this was late in 1941, say, and uh, show them what to sing, how to, to sing the numbers by Daryl Sanek, the head of the studio. And uh, lo and behold, the purge came, and Daryl Sanek, the head of the studio, suggested, why don't you write songs? I said, I did that already. He said, when did you write songs? I said, well, I wrote a song in 19... 29, which was one of the big hits called Sunday, but I don't want to write songs. Songs are for older people. I thought so. All my lyric writers were older men, so I thought <laughs> songwriting was for older people. And uh, he said, I'm going to get you a job at Republic Studios, but you'll write songs. And uh, I was a gambling fellow, though, then, and, you know, he said, look, you're only going to get $135 a week where you're getting $1,500 here. I said, I can't make it on $135. He said, you'll make it. You're a gambler. Gamble on yourself for a change. And so I took the job at Republic Studios. Well, Republic Studio then was a sea of mud. You could never <laughs> get in a, a sea of mud. The, it, for some reason, it, when it rained in the valley in California, the, this whole <laughs> studio had no cement on the sidewalk or pavements. It was a sea of mud. But the cowboy seemed to relish in it. And I wrote for Gene Autry, mm -hmm. his horse. You wrote, for the horse, wrote too? for the horse, too? I wrote for the horse, too. Everybody doubled. <laughs> Uh, Roy Rogers, Smiley Burnett, Gabby Hayes, and Judy Canova, and uh, it was a hysterical piece. You see, my office, my studio where I worked, was really, the front of it was a it said saloon in front. They used it as a building, you know. But in back saloon was my office. And when they shot a picture in this saloon, I had to move to another place, some stable somewhere. And, uh, well, those were the days, you know, uh, it's amazing at Republic. Uh, for instance, there was a movie where Smiley Burnett was riding along with Roy Rogers, and they both were eating watermelon. And so the director says, I want a song here called I Love Watermelon. I said, why does he have to sing I Love? Why is he singing at all? He says, because he's happy. Well, why can't I write him a song, The Sun's Bright Today or something? He says, no, this cowboy is happy when he says I Love Watermelon. I mean, just absolutely insanity. <laughs> but the good things did come from Republic. I wrote my first song with, with uh, Frank Lesser. Oh, yes, you're yeah, a great songwriter. But I'll tell you a lovely story. Frank Lesser came over to do a musical of Republic. And he w hated me for bringing him to Republic. See, he was working at Paramount, making his way there. It seemed that Frank Lesser was writing all the hit songs at, at uh, Paramount, like Says My Heart, Jingle Jangle, all those songs. But Johnny Mercer was getting all the big pictures. And he says, you've demeaned me, Julie. I said, no, Frank, I asked you to come over here. You see, I'm starting out as a songwriter in movies. And I, wanted, I want to write hit songs. And you know how to write a hit song, because you're the best. And so he says, well, all right, play me something, kid. And so I sat down at the piano and played, da, 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 da. He says, shh. We'll never play that again here. I'm going to take you to Paramount. We'll write it at Paramount. <laughs> of course, subsequently we wrote, I Don't Want to Walk Without You, Baby, which was my first real big hit in the movies. Julie, was that what you called one of your trunk songs? I know in the book you, uh, you had these songs that you said, well, I'll use them later. Did Shall you I put tell them you in about the trunk? Using later? Please do. I really don't have a trunk. Yes, I have it. You see, after I wrote my first song in 1929 and didn't write again until 1940, you see, my trunk is my brain. I see. A lot of songs were stored in there. Mm. The years that I should have been writing, I didn't write. 
So therefore, when I did start writing in 1940, it was all there. You see, I don't write at a piano. I think the fellows who have trunk songs are the fellows who compose them at the piano. Mm -hmm. You know, and they, they play and they remember their trunk songs. Yeah. I, even as I sit and talk to you now, I'm probably writing some song. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but it's, I, I replenish my brain all the time with songs. And if I have to work, like say this afternoon I had to start on a movie or a play, all I have to know is the story, the character, and the plot points. I will sit down and write. And what I write for that scene or that special scene, the lyric writer will know it fits because I'm a dramatist and it fits. Right. I never doodle. I never, hey, I'll try this, like you do at the piano. See, the piano gives you, a, for me, is false to write music at because I play very well and anybody plays very well. They're flattering their ego how they play. I see. And they're not giving credence or mm -hmm. first position to the melodic texture. They're seeing how well it'll sound, and that's false writing. I think one has to be stark, naked, with that pencil in a dark room, so to speak. And he I has think, to start I, at the very I think beginning. La Boheme wasn't too, I think when you're hungry, you write better. Well, that's true. Julie, I'd like you to prove, uh, prove that by playing some songs for us, but we're gonna take a break right now. When we come back, we'll go to the piano, okay? Lovely. You can, you can play some of your losing Academy Awards songs. Well, That's a great song, Julie. Thank it you. really is. You must, you, you must have a great understanding of people to be able to write a song that way. Yes, I love people, and uh, that song was so wonderful, and it certainly suited Barbara Streisand very well. You know I was responsible for putting Barbara in the show. Yes. <laughs> it, subconsciously, for Funny Girl, we had Anne Bancroft sign, but I went and heard Barbara for 27 straight nights in a restaurant in the village of New York, and I was so impressed that subconsciously I was writing my whole score for her, but we had Anne Bancroft sign for the part. And but great thing happened, Anne Bancroft said, you'll never get anybody to sing that difficult score. You know, Rain on My Parade is a rather difficult yes, song. It it's a very physical was, song. Yeah, too, and it? music that makes me dance. Mm -hmm. You know, you remember Rain on My Parade? Yes. And, and, and music that makes me dance, difficult score, and Barb, and, uh, and said, uh, you'll never get anyone to sing and act the part. And Jerome Robbins, our director, said, well, if we don't, we won't have a show. But I do know one thing, this is the score. And so uh, it was very gratifying to me that I gambled on my opinion of Barbara, and she turned out so wonderful in the show. Oh. And so People has a great significance for me. It was a smash success. You know, I have no favorite song. You know, people ask me, what is your favorite song? I've written 1,400 songs. They're like children, I, I like them equally well. The moments in my life that have to do with people where a certain song was written, that seems to be my most important part because where I've done things for people or they've done things for me, my whole life's been based like that. I enjoy the spirit of people. And I think if you don't, you're missing an awful lot in life. Well, music is, is the international language, they say, and uh, you, you must have a great understanding of it. I know that you uh, started out to be a concert pianist. Yes. Is that what your mother wanted? Well, you know, I was a child entertainer. I was born in London, England, mm -hmm. and Sir Harry Lauder told my mother and father, after I jumped on a stage and performed with him yes, one night, it was years a old ghastly <laughs> thing. Brat jumped on a stage at the, uh, at the, uh, the Coliseum, it was called then, and... Uh, there I was uh, singing Harry Lauder's song right along with Harry Lauder, and of course the audience thought he was working with a shill or a plant, you know. <laughs> and uh, I went back to apologize, and when I went back to play, he said, never imitate, and why don't you let this boy study piano because he intuitively is musically inclined. And so when we came to Chicago, we moved to Chicago to the States, I started studying piano, and I won a Mozart scholarship. And uh, I appeared with Chicago Symphony Orchestra, also, also at Cincinnati and Detroit. And I was moving right along and uh, until I found out one day from Harold Bauer, the great pianist, my hand was too small. But I'll show you what my father paid 
far. You know, he never accepted my success as a songwriter because really? he never paid for that. He paid for a piano. <laughs> he said, how can you write songs when I paid for you to read piano? <laughs> so this is what my father played for. If he were here now, he would say, you ought to hear him play when he was eight years old, I play suppose. Play on, play on. That's enough for my father. <laughs> but, okay, uh, Let, let's go into the speakeasy days in Chicago. Well, that was an interesting time. Well, we played a lot. You know, these strains that I later wrote the show Gypsy, which was the burlesque thing. I played in burlesque theaters when I was at Poi Ranch really? Club. I was about 12 years old. You know, we were very poor people. Anything to make a dollar, you know? And... So everything I learned in my youth, the classical training, plus anything else, mm -hmm. served me it served well, you in life. served me in life because I knew what I was doing. You know, I played with bands around Chicago. Uh, one band, the Ben Pollock band, had Glenn Miller, Jack T. Garden, Charlie Spivak, and Benny Goodman, oh, and I played wow. all in the same band. And we all went on from there, and then I, I wasn't happy with that. You see, I was never happy coaching songs. In fact, the first part of my life as a songwriter, I wasn't happy because what I wanted to be was a concert pianist. Mm -hmm. Due to the a lack of capacity in my fingers, I had to give it up, but even my reach was you, too small. Even after you played with Benny Goodman and Glenn Miller and Jack Teagarden, you still wanted to be a concert pianist? Yeah. You still had that in I your I missed mind. it, sure. I didn't stay with that. I went on to coaching girls, anything else. And then finally, <clears throat> I wrote one song when I was about 17 years old, I wrote a song called Sunday. In 1929, I wrote a song called Sunday. But I didn't want to be, write songs. That isn't what I wanted either. And it was a hit. Yeah, well. I didn't want to write. I, I lacked something in my life. I, I always, I guess in my subconscious, I always wanted to be that concert pianist. And uh, it wasn't, well, I got into all sorts of bad habits during my life as a songwriter. It wasn't until after Gypsy that I realize I'm pretty good. And now I don't have to do silly things like gamble away my life savings to prove that. I only did it to prove, look how important I am. It you, seems that when you tell people you've lost, you draw much, much more attention than when you tell them you win. Well, that's true. Julie, there is something I want to say about Gypsy, and I've been wanting to say this to you all morning. I took my daughter Susan to see that. It was her first Broadway, sh or her first uh, musical play that she had ever seen. She was 14 years old at the time. And she came out loving the theater. To me, Gypsy is the American, American opera. It's something that's going to live on forever and ever. And I say that because I really mean it. it it's a great classical story. The music is absolutely beautiful. It'll never die. Shall I play a short overture? Oh, please do. Our, our audience Since you love it so that. much? Please do. And it was a big hit here in Boston. That's right. This is where it all happened. That's right. All right. Please play it. Thank you.
me entertain you. Let me see you smile. Let me do a few tricks, some old and then some new tricks. I'm very versatile. And if you're real good, I'll make you feel good. I want your spirits to climb. So let me entertain you. And we'll have a real good time. Yes, sir. And there you are. Oh, that's fantastic. <coughs> that is absolutely beautiful. You heard that burlesque music in that, Yes, didn't you? I did, yeah. yeah. The Chicago uh, That's right. Touch. Chicago reared its <laughs> ugly head into the <laughs> gypsy. Um, Let me ask you something. Why did Ethel Merman not do that in movies? Why did well, she not play the that's lead? that's the Hollywood picture that you know so well. You, we always, they always uh, figured, well, we'll get somebody else. You know, it, some of those things are like the movie of Funny Girl. The stage play of Funny Girl, I thought, was absolutely brilliant. And the character, as played by Barbara, Fanny Bryce, mm -hmm. made her a strong woman, what Fanny Bryce was. No self pity at the end when the man walks out on her. It was both of their faults, but she didn't weep over it in the stage play. She sang, she became strong. Yes. She says, uh, remember, she sings, uh, I'll cry a little later. Yes. But nobody's nobody. It's gonna rain on my parade. That's where the curtain came down. She was a strong woman. In the play, in the movie, rather, they make the movie, and all of a sudden, at the end of the play, she says, oh, my man, I love him so. That is a good song. But it defeated the character in the play. She became a self-pitying woman. She lost her strength. And I think that's one of the reasons the play didn't, the movie did not win the Academy Award. It was Award. Not as effective. Of course, you do something on Broadway, uh, and it becomes very emotional to the audience. And you uh, you repeat it the same way in a movie, and it's nothing. It's, no. it, the there's impact some, is not there. There's something marvelous about the theater, and I think it's yeah. the greatest medium for uh, expression, for at least for me, for mm -hmm. a creator. You live and die by your own work. In other yes. words, if it's bad, you take all the blame, and rightfully so. If it's good, you get all the blame. See, in Hollywood, you're an accommodator. You're not a creator. They tell you, musically I'm speaking now, mm -hmm. they tell you what they want musically. They look upon songwriters as nothing out there. They mistreated Rogers and Hart in the beginning. Very shabbily did they treat Dick Rogers. They call them the songwriters. And they don't have the, the respect that the theater, not only that, when, you, when you're in the theater, you use your imagination more. You become involved with the drama. It's, you know that they're going to change scenery in the theater, right. but you still right. live in that fantasy that, look at that, that we're in another place. There. The magic is mm -hmm. there. You know, and there's no magic in movies. I'm not, I love movies, uh, the good ones, uh, but the magic is gone and uh, there's something very special about the theater and the theater is growing and growing and growing. I, there isn't, I suppose there isn't a small town, village or city, whatever, that doesn't have a theater group and the That's children nice. of today, even my daughter, I have a daughter who's ten and a half and she's going to appear in a, uh, a musical at school and they're involved with drama. They're doing a thing called A Woman's Rights. I mean, ten and a half years <laughs> old. Half years and it's old. A, original scores they write. They have people who write these scores. It's wonderful. And I think that in the next ten years, the generation, the new generation of today, I'm speaking of the innocents, mm -hmm. not when they get 12, when they're ten and a half, I think they will grow into a very a fee, a big field where they'll appreciate the theater even more than any generation has in the past. That's so wonderful for children. It really is. Yes, it is. Julie. Um, talking about American music, uh, there's no question that the great American music was written for the stage, not for movies, really. Of course. Uh, but there is one exception to that, 
and that's the songs that Julie Stein composed for movies. Now, you've got a, I don't know how many times you were nominated for Academy Awards. Uh, seven was, times. Was it seven times? It took me eighth, the eighth time to win. I think the, you know what it is? I think there comes a time when they say, let, let's let him win it this year. <laughs> and usually you win it for the wrong song. Do you believe But in that? my case, well, I, I don't know. I, I'm going to play. I'm going to play seven songs now, and I let the audience okay. judge. I think everyone. These is are winner. losers, ladies and gentlemen. They really are. And I, I got ready, expecting to win every time. Got up out of my seat, and they named oh. someone else. Julie, play something. the losers for us now. This was written with lyrics by Frank Lesser. I don't want to walk without you, baby. Walk without my arms. I thought the day you left me behind I'd take a stroll and get you right off my mind But now I find And then here is another loser With lyrics by Sammy Khan It seems to me I heard that song before it's from an old familiar scar. Another loser with Sammy Khan. The things we did last summer. I'll remember all winter long. And this was sung by Mr. Sinatra in a film called It Happened in Brooklyn. And a lot of people, in fact, the little girl in the studio says this was her favorite song. And it is almost one of my favorite songs. lyric by Sammy Khan and it went I only know what I know the passing years will show you kept my love so young so new and time after time I tell myself that I'm so lucky to be loving you. And Dinah Shaw did this in a movie. I walk alone. Just another loser. And then there came a song that Sinatra sang, and uh, this was in Anchors Away. And the little sailor suit sat here in the Hollywood Bowl, and he sang, I fall in love too easily. I fall in love too fast. Too easily, too fast, it's still lost. Sinatra and all. And then we came with Doris Day sang this in the movie called Romance on the High Seas. Another loser, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> One year in 1953, Mr. Sinatra said, Julie, I think you're going to win it at long last this year. And he says, and you better get yourself a new tuxedo. Well, I ordered myself a new tuxedo, and uh, I called my tailor in New York. I said, you have the measurements. The idea is not how well you make it. You've got to have it here in five days. And in five days it came, just a day before the Academy Awards. 
And that night I went to the Academy Awards with my new tuxedo and they did announce my name. And the song was, oh, I must tell you the end of it. After I won the Academy Award, I came home at the party and there was a telegram from my tailor and expecting congratulations. He had much to watch it on television. But instead, it didn't say congratulations. It said, Julie, I must take the shoulder in an inch and a half. And here is the song. in the fountain, the right. Oscar winner. You finally made it, Julie. Finally made <laughs> Bravo. It. Uh, we promised our audience we'd tell them the story about the Pope. Tell yeah. me that story now. Well, of all the, there are about 500 stories in my book, as you well know. <laughs> right. I, I love this because there was so much wonderful warmth and truth in this whole story. I was very impressed. I w always wanted an audience with his highness, and Pius was Pope mm -hmm. then. Pius XII. 56. Right. 1956, and uh, I was over in Rome for the first time, and someone arranged an audience, to my surprise, of Rome. Well, first of all, I, I got a citation from the Italian government for writing three coins in a fountain, and it was a big thing. Mm. You should see all the business they did account of my song. <laughs> Thousands of people around there with three coins in a fountain, <laughs> and so uh, that very momentous day, I. There I was in front of His, Highness, His Holiness uh, Pius. Wonderful man, bright. Mm. In fact, I went to a mass where he spoke in 16 languages. Oh. Did a mass in 16 languages, unbelievable. The following Sunday he invited me. But then he spoke about the song and he had a great sense of humor. He says, uh, you know, there are many Italians claim they wrote that song. How should you, why should you have written that song? And he said, uh, how did you write it? And a few more questions. And asked me if I knew Phil Silvers. Phil really? Silvers had an audience with Pope Pius. <laughs> <That wasn't laughs> really. Phil Silvers being the best friend. <laughs> and on the way out, he says, you know, I have never heard it, which I thought was very sweet. And I said, well, you know, it's always more people have heard than not heard. He laughed. He says, how does it go? And I said, pure Mascagni. <laughs> As you well know, the end of goes, make it mine, da da da. That's like the aria from Cavalier, right, you know? Right, Chinese music. Yeah, <laughs> and so he laughed at that. And I was very, I always remember, pure Mascagni, and he laughed. Great what was sense that, of humor. That's sweet. Shows you that he was a human being, too. Well, he, he <laughs> certainly is bright. He was a bright man. And uh, sadly, uh, the next, he passed away that same year. He died in the summer that That's year. That's right, he did. Yeah. Late summer that year, or the early fall, something I know. I'm yeah. still quite sure. Well, Julie, it's been a great experience for me, especially, to have you here on the Hollywood Backlot. Uh, and I just want to tell our viewers that this book here has many, many more stories, like the, uh, the story of Pope Pius. Well, it's a story of the yearn to live. I've enjoyed my life. It's the people in it that have made my life. That's what counts. Well, it shows in the book, Julie, and I want everybody to go out and buy it. It's an absolutely fantastic book. It tells you about uh, Julie in London, where he was born, his early days in Chicago, uh, his experiences in Hollywood, and then the ultimate, Broadway. Oh, and it's... my period with Frank Sinatra, which is hilarious. Oh, you've, you've got to read it just for the Sinatra stuff alone. Julie, Thanks so much for being part of our show Thank today. You. It's been we'll never forget most this. Enjoyable. I hope you'll come back in the near oh, future yeah, next time Boston, you come to Boston. Anyhow. Okay. Thanks, Julie.